Good morning everyone and welcome to our third lecture for holistic health. So this lecture is very focused on care routines and we will explore and develop an understanding of those as we go through the rest of this lecture. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Noongar people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This painting is by a local Fremantle artist, Deborah Newham Cortez. And Deborah says as part of her explanation that the painting represents the Noongar six seasons and will also be hanging on display during the art trail initiative that was held as part of the Fremantle markets a couple of years ago. She's also designed a postcard that provided some information about the Noongar seasons as well. Now, for those of you that don't realise, the Noongar nations have six seasons that they recognise, which is very different to our four seasons that we often see represented in our literature and so on. When you're doing things in a classroom or in a childcare setting, always make sure that you are taking into account the Noongar seasons. And we are currently in the Dil Dilja Bar? season it's the first spring which is the end of winter moving into spring and it's the season of conception so it's a mixture of wet days which we're definitely seeing with an increasing number of clear cold nights and pleasant warm days as it starts to progress so very accurate with what we are seeing at the moment so let's move into our plan for our lecture so we're going to define what a care routine is when we're looking at it from an early childhood perspective. We're going to look at the importance of those within our children and the way that we set up our systems and processes within our childcare settings. We're going to look at our four main care routines and go into one main one today, which is all about our transitions and arrivals and departures. And then we're going to look at where the care routines fit with the NQS and the EYLF. So first of all, let's look at what are children's essential needs. So we have our basic needs of food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep, rest, fresh air, cleanliness. We then, as we've discussed in previous tutorials, we have this idea of safety. So they have to feel safe and secure emotionally, but also be in an environment that is safe and protects them from harm and obviously infection and in injury and so on. As we go through, you will find that there are different routines and so on that we have in an early year setting that build that idea of safety as well. We've then got all our social needs that need to be met. So feeling love and compassion, feeling belongingness and welcoming, relationships and social contacts. You'll see that our routines that we set up in early childhood are around building those ideas of social needs and meeting those social needs through various forms. We have esteem needs, so developing a really good positive self-image, making sure you understand who you are and where you fit in the world and how all the other people that are around you fit with you and so on. Making sure that we acknowledge that every little human and big human needs appreciation, praise and recognition for their achievements and efforts. And the final one that is often not talked about is that self-actualization. So the idea of being creative, having a bit of fun, feeling that genuine joy for life and that you have meaning to your life. So each of these essential needs, they're not just for children, they're for every human. That's what we need. We need our basic needs met, but then we've got our social needs, our safety needs, our esteem needs and our self-actualization. So all of those are developed with all of the important people that are in your life from the time you're very little all the way through to the time that you move on. So we as early childhood educators need to be aware of how important our role is in this whole process. So a CEQA says that as educators we are actively engaged in children's learning and we should be sharing that decision making with them. We want to make sure that we are doing lots and lots of things every day during our play, our routines, which is what we're going to focus on, and 
in all of the other ongoing projects. So all of those things that you plan in a center, the different activities, the different provocations, the different experiences that you have, making sure that they're all designed to enrich their learning. But making sure that what we're doing is keeping the children actively involved and keeping us as the educators involved with the children. We're not just setting up experiences and letting the children go off and do them by themselves. We're part of that and we're being actively engaged with the children's learning. Now, when we're in early childhood, we need to think about how do we set our days up and why do we set them up in certain ways? So one of the things that has come out consistently from day dot of humans is that routines they are essential in a child's life. So the routine of how you wake up in the morning, how you are greeted, when your mummy picks you up, when you get held in different ways, your food that you have during the day, your movements to the shops, to the um, park, waiting for your big brother or sister to come home, all those sorts of things, those routines, they are part of what form your day. A chaotic day means that the child is not going to feel settled and comfortable. So in a childcare setting where we are able to have those routines in place, we think very carefully about how and why we set those routines up. Now, the four ones that we're going to look at at this point through our course is we've brought them into these broad categories. So we're looking at the idea of arrivals and departures and within that comes transitions from inside to outside, from food time to nap time and so on. So it's all of those changes from one location or one type of activity to another. Our second one is that we're looking at nappy changing and toileting. So as they move through their stages of development, they will move through different needs that they have within that. Our third routine that we focus on a lot in a couple of weeks time is feeding and our meal times, making sure that we understand our role as an educator and as somebody who provides adequate nutrition for the children, as well as health and safety issues to do with feeding and meal times. And then our final one is our naps and our rest time, because we know that the rest time and nap times, that's the time when the baby's brain is growing and adapting to the world around them in the best way possible. Making sure that a child has adequate sleep is crucial. Anyone that has ever babysat or anyone that has a parent or even is an older sibling knows how awful it is when a little one doesn't get adequate rest time in some way. Awful for them and awful for all of the adults around them as well. So let's have a look at why routines are so important. So when we're thinking about a routine, we think about it as they're the things we do during the day. But when we really start to analyze it out, they're the part of the days that are where we are interacting with the children at a very close level. So we're making sure that we are touching the children, we are taking care of their basic needs, we are giving them appropriate cuddles and all those sorts of things and we're settling them and making sure that they feel safe and comfortable and loved. Now we've got this idea that we have nappy changing, we have feeding, we've got dressing, we've got sleeping. They all come under this umbrella term of care routines but what we have is these other parts that go with those care routines. We know that if you just treated a child like you would a dog and you took care of their basics, yeah, that's okay, but it's not going to lead to a well-developed child. And the same even with your dogs if you only take care of them in that way. We know that those care routines are where we demonstrate our care for the child. So when we're going through those routines, they are essential for that overall development and their learning in lots of different ways. So one of the ways is that it's where we actually form attachments to the children and more importantly, the children form attachments to their caregivers. Now you may think, but I'm in childcare. I don't want a child attached to me. Absolutely you are in childcare and absolutely the children will become attached to you. 
It's the way that humans are designed to be. We need other humans in our lives. For starters, babies can't survive without adults and older people to take care of them. Babies, human babies, are mammals that need an older mammal to take care of them. So we have to take on that role because the primary caregiver, the parent, is entrusting that to us. So attachment is one way of describing that relationship between a child and a caregiver. It makes the child feel safe, it makes them feel secure, and it makes them feel protected. When a child doesn't feel those, they are going to be very, very sensitive. They're likely to cry a lot more. They're likely to be a lot fussier. They're likely to have major separation anxiety, or they'll move to the other side, which is what we see in some children who have been in orphanages or they've been in multiple foster cares and so on, where they don't feel secure with adults and they actually start to do very inappropriate things because they don't have a secure base. So we want a child to feel safe and secure. If you want to read a little bit more about attachment, the link is there for you that you can follow up later on. I know that as part of child development and various other courses you'll do, you'll explore attachment in a lot more detail. There isn't a difference between attachment and bonding. Bonding is what the primary caregiver does with their child and that's when you have all of those beautiful experiences as a mother or a father or as primary caregiver of some sort. We are attaching and the child is attaching to us and that's why in childcare we want to try and have the same people with the children at different points in time. We don't want to have rotating people through the baby's room in particular. We want to have that attachment where the little ones feel safe and secure and that's what we want they want them to we want a child to feel safe secure and protected within our environment at the childcare setting so the purpose of attachment is not just to play with the child sometimes people think oh it's where I play it's the whole idea we're making them feel safe secure and protected now we want to be able to set some limits for the child and we want to be able to help teach them some new skills as well. And all of those things can happen as part of our care routines. So when we think about what is a routine versus attachment, those ideas of creating those really predictable patterns of what's going to happen during the day. So we know that a child's tummy is only little, so therefore we need to feed a little baby quite often. And that because a tummy is only little, their digestive system works quite effectively. And that means they're going to be pooping and weeing a whole lot as well. Food in, food out. We know that because they are very little, that they need to have lots of sleep. They need to have lots of rest. They also need to have lots of play and lots of different experiences as they move through. So as a childcare worker, we need to make sure that we are creating those routines, we're creating those patterns that allow the children to know, gosh, when I have my food, then I'm going to have some play, then my care is going to hold me for a little while, then I'm going to go to sleep, then when I wake up, my care is going to be there again, and then I know what my day is going to happen. So they feel safe and secure because they know what's happening at each point. They know that when I get popped into the childcare, into my um, seat, I get popped into the car, then I get taken out, then I get handed over to this lovely lady at the childcare centre and I say goodbye to mummy and then I play all day and I have a great time and then mummy comes to pick me up in the afternoon. So the child needs those predictable routines to feel safe and secure. Now, our responsibility as a childcare worker or the lead educator is to organise and work out what is that day going to look like, knowing what we know about child development, about their need for sleep, about their need for food, about the toileting and the developmental time that those things happen. We are creating that stable, predictable and caring environment that every child needs to thrive. So let's have a look at our four main care routines. 
So our first one that we're going to delve into in depth during our tutorial this week is arrivals and departures. And we're also including in there your transitions from inside to outside time, from activity time to quiet time and so on. So we're looking at what happens when a parent comes in, drops off their child. How do we bring that child in? What are we doing? And we're going to look at it from different age groups because you do different things. Our next routine is the one that I actually think is most important for most children is their food and their meal times. Now that dramatically changes as we go through all the developmental levels. So what a six week old child is doing is vastly different to a six month child, which is again very, very different to a two year old, which again is very different to a six year old. So each of those feeding and meal times as the child grows and changes and develops, they will have different needs. They'll have different timings. Then, of course, they will have different foods that they will be eating. So in a couple of weeks time, we will explore that in great depth. And we'll also look at our responsibilities for the hygiene and so on in feeding and meal times. Nap and rest times, crucial, absolutely crucial. You'll find sometimes that you will have babies who need lots and lots of rest and then you have babies that are, yeah, they don't really care about it. They just do a bit and then they're back up again and so on. And that's part of the individualized nature of a child's need for sleep. The need for sleep is very different between different age groups as well. And the final care routine that we're looking at is our nappy changing moving into toileting. So they become part of our routines and they provide beautiful opportunities to develop some wonderful language with the children and so on. Now, toilet uh, training and nap time, they're, they're, they are the ones that give particular challenges for our childcare providers. So you want to develop good relationships with the primary caregivers so you can find out what happens at home so you can reinforce some of the things at the child care centre and vice versa as well if a parent is having difficulties at home but you're not having any difficulties in the centre you can give them examples of what works really well in the centre and so on. So within your assignment that you've got the one where you're building a website is you're choosing two routines so these will be two that you will choose from these four that we have here. So let's have a look at arrivals and departures in a little bit more detail. So one of the lovely quotes I found when I was researching was how we handle separations is developed really early in life. So how we help children deal with and handle separation is of utmost importance and can be life shaping. So separation anxiety starts to happen usually at around nine months of age. It's when the child actually works out they are a different person from their mum or their dad, whoever is their primary caregiver. And they realise and they're like, uh oh, they're not here anymore. And so that's where you'll find that you need to really think about what are your arrivals and departures looking like because there will be a difference from very young babies and then once they get to that nine to 12 months of age, your heart breaks because sometimes they really, really do cry when mummy drops them off. Now, these times, they allow the children to extend how they trust their parents and educators. So it extends their circle of trust and their circle of people that they feel happy with. So you always want to think about what can you put in place that's going to make that arrival as smooth as possible and the departure as smooth as possible as well. Because you do get the opposite happen sometimes that the children are really attached to one or more of the childcare workers or some of the other children in the centre and they don't want to go home. So then you often have the same type of thing happen on the reverse at the end of the day. So think about the processes that you may have seen that are operating in a childcare centre and or a school that you may have observed on your first prac. How did they make it work so that it was a really smooth transition? And we're going to explore this one in much more depth during our tutorial this week. 
So keep in mind, separation anxiety is a really normal part of child development. It's where the child is learning that they are a different entity from the other adults around them. It's where they're learning where they can push their boundaries and that people will still love them and that they will always have people that they can bounce back to and so on. But arrivals and departures, you want to make them as smooth as possible for the caregivers and for yourself at the child care centre. So our next one is feeding and particularly focused on infant feeding. So we know that babies only need breast milk or formula for the first few months of life and baby's tummy really small. So they need to be fed lots and lots of times during a day, every two to four hours when they're very young and then stretching that out a little bit more. And sometimes that will be even more during the day if the child has started to sleep all the way through the night. Where possible, breast milk is ideal, but it's not always possible. So you may have in a childcare setting that parents will send you in the little sachets with the breast milk. You will make sure that you will have labels. You will put it in the right place. It will be frozen more than likely, or it may be fresh that you will use that day and so on. There's lots and lots of infant formulas. We're lucky in Australia that we have really good health regulations. So our infant formulas are perfectly manufactured and they are 100% safe. We have to always, as a childcare educator, you will have very, or you should have very clear processes for how you handle the breast milk or prepare the formula. So when we are talking about being careful, you will need to document how much a child drank, how much they ate, if you've moved them onto solids. You'll need to be able to articulate how it was safely handled and so on. There will be labels, there will be storage, there will be saving, there will be, yes, all of those things should be in policies along with, of course, hand washing and sterilisation of whatever materials are used. Different centres have different rules regarding the sending in of bottles versus keeping bottles at the centre and so on. It'll depend on the size of the centre, the number of babies that you have and the policies the centre has in place. Now, when we talk about feeding infants, this is one of the first times to really develop that attachment. Can you see in the picture the mother and the baby and how close they are? Little babies, they only see about 30 centimetres ahead of them and usually only in black, white and bright colours. So they're designed to be focused on a mother's face from about the point of where they are holding them to feed. So infants, they need that beautiful nurturing feeding relationship. Please don't ever prop a bottle to feed a baby. We will talk about this more in tutorials, but feeding should be a time where you are holding the baby and you are giving them not just the nutrition, but their emotional feeding as well. So it's opportunities for you to be able to talk, to be close, to might sing a song and so on. You want to have that good feeding relationship where you understand when the child is full and when they might need some more. And it's a beautiful time. So babies are learning through their senses. So when you are holding them, you are feeding them, they are being hardwired and it's developing their neurons in different forms. It's how they learn. So we talk about who decides when a baby eats. You will receive some information from the child's parents and they will say, look, this is about their schedule. But know that every couple of weeks that might change when they're teething, they might have a tummy upset, they might, it might be their first week in childcare and they might not feed a lot because they're a bit stressed and so on. So you always want to think about what are the cues the baby gives you. And when you are around babies for a while, you will work out their hungry cry versus their whiny cry when they just want some attention and so on. So you will see that when they are hungry, it's a very short window you have to get something in their mouth that they will be satisfied by. And again, you'll see the signs that a child has had enough. So you'll see them stop sucking, they'll turn their face away, they'll spit the stuff out or 
we call it the milk drunk where they start to just fall asleep in your arms because their tummies are full, sends a beautiful signal to their brain and then they know that they are feeling safe and full and happy and then they go to sleep. So this we cannot emphasize enough is the time to develop that beautiful relationship with the babies in your care. So it's also absolutely crucial for good nutrition. Now, babies grow and double their weight in a few months. So they need to eat a lot and they need to ensure that it is correctly prepared. So if you're preparing formulas, there is particular like they have little measure scoops in them. You follow exactly what it says so that it gives them the right amount. Or breast milk is designed by the mother to give the baby the right amount and so on as well. So we make sure that we are really putting things into practice in the best way possible. So when we're thinking about older children and their feeding, this becomes a time to find out about the world around them. I love this photo. Anyone that has been in contact with a little toddler, they love spaghetti. It's great. They get their hands in and so on. And we can put plates down. We can do everything, but they're going to make a mess. So we want them to have a lovely array of really good, healthy foods. And we will talk about what is good nutrition at different ages. And it's actually surprising how much little babies eat. Once they start on solids and then that one to two year old, I would see sometimes my one to two year old when my boys were little, they would eat, swear to God, more than me. So they are again growing through a massive growth as well as they're very, 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 very active once they've started to walk. So babies learn about their environment through smells and colours and it's where they're putting everything in their mouth as well. So we have to make sure that we give them things that are edible as well as allow them to, you know, they're going, we call it mouthing things, allow them to put things in their mouth that are appropriate to put in their mouths. So you will have certain guidelines, every toy that you buy at any shop will have guidelines and it'll say not suitable for children three and under because they can swallow pieces from it. So we make sure up until the age of three that we think about everything that is available for a child that is edible and everything that they could possibly put in their mouths. So toddlers can be tricky. We know that they are likely to say no to lots of things even if they have eaten it for the past five days. Today might be the day they choose not to eat that. So we want them to be able to establish their own autonomy. We want them to be able to assert themselves. We want them to use their thumb and index finger and a pincer grasp so that then they can self-feed. Now, I know lots of babies who from kind of 10, 11 months old, they are feeding themselves well and truly. So they're still taking a bottle sometimes, but then they're moving on to being able to pick up foods and move it around and move it into their own mouths confidently themselves. And they do not want to be fed with a spoon. So look at what works for different children and other babies love to be fed. So you always want to think about the way that you are interacting. It might be that you are sitting with them. So depending on the size of your center and so on, it might be that you're providing that model for them about what we do and how we sit and how we eat and how we use our utensils and so on. So as part of your routines, you think about how do we make it easier for carers and for the children. So you want to keep wait time to a real minimum. You can think about how do you build in finger plays and singing and storytelling while we're waiting for things. You might have a centre that has all of the plates sitting on one side and the children have to go and collect a plate, collect a spoon, come and sit down, collect a cup, and then they have part of the process where they can serve themselves and so on. You may have a centre where all the food is popped on a plate and popped on in front of them. It depends on the way that the centre is set up and the way that they want to run it. I find that the larger the centre, the more likely routines are in place that are designed for getting children in and out appropriately so that everyone can get fed in a sensible amount of time and so on. Think about things like calming music, making sure that you have a calm 
persona yourself and you're not rushing the children to hurry and eat their food because sometimes they take forever to eat something. So very good routines, nice and simple for you with their food. Nap times. We know that babies eat, sleep and poop all the time. That is what they do and babies sleep often. I remember my eldest son, one day I got really, really worried. I worked out he had slept 22 hours out of 24 hours. He was going through a growth spurt and he just needed to sleep. And he I, he just kept falling asleep on me and I kept putting him down and I was really worried he was sick. But I realised he wasn't running a temperature and nothing else. He just needed to sleep. And then conversely, a few weeks later, he barely slept. So it's part of their growth that their sleeping needs change. Toddlers, as much as they resist going to sleep, they still need a lot to meet their high energies. Now, toddlers will need 10 to 12 hours uninterrupted at night, preferably, and they'll need a couple of naps during the day. Sometimes they'll be one long nap. They kind of transition as they go through. In a few weeks when we talk about sleep, we will talk about their needs at different developmental ages. When we're in a centre, you think about how the nap times are being dealt with and nap times will be different at de different developmental ages. So naps are more of a predictable, dependable, consistent time that happens when you're talking about the toddlers. With babies, it's a lot more when they need them. Whereas with toddlers, you might find in a particular centre that all of the children in the toddler rooms will go to sleep at the same time. There will be a time from say one o'clock till three o'clock where every child is laying down. Sometimes actually it might be earlier than that. And then the same thing will happen in a school-based setting with my kindies. When we would come in from outside time after lunch, we would always have a lay down and I would always have more than one child that would fall asleep. And that was all the way through to the end of the year. They're only four. They still get worn out with lots of things. Now, sleepy children are grumpy children, so you want to make sure that you are building in effective nap, time, nap times. We shouldn't, um, yeah, they should be allowed to just rest sometimes. But they'll often bring in blankets or pillows from home. They might have their sleeping stuffed toy or their little ruggy or something like that. So there is very strict Australian guidelines on SIDS and keep safe sleeping. So we will go through that in a few more weeks when we delve into the sleep and how you should have your cribs and sleeping areas set up in a setting depending on the age of the child and their mobility and so on. So we always want to think about having that nap or quiet time for our preschool children and even in our kindies and pre-primaries. Some children, particularly in the first term, they really struggle in kindy and pre-primary because they've had lots of lots of things happening over the school holidays, but they get to have quite often lots of downtime. Whereas when they're at school, they're being super stimulated every day. So it's quite different for them. All right, now on to our nappy changing, our thing that I know lots of you are like, hmm. So our routine for nappy changing. Toileting is an essential element. Every living thing needs to eliminate waste from their body in some form. So this quote's very funny. Changing a nappy is a lot like getting a present from grandma. You're not really sure what you've got, but you're pretty sure you're probably not gonna like it. So nappy changing is something that we need to do. So we need to see if nappy changes are necessary. So you're going to be checking in their nappy. Some babies don't mind being having their nappy chained. Others literally try and flip over on you and run away all the time. So you have to be very organized. There will be a setup in the baby's room at your childcare setting to be able to change your nappy very quickly. You need to make sure everything is organized. In a couple of weeks, we'll go through that process of changing a nappy to make sure that you have understood the things you need to put in place as well as hygiene. So you wanna think about nappy changing, not just from attending to the child's physical elimination needs where we're wiping and so on but it can be a real learning experience so think about the way that babies kick and move when you are changing them think about how you can talk and laugh and tickle and giggle and so on 
think about that touching and smiling that goes on between you and the child. So remember that 30 centimetres for feeding is also about the same distance when you're changing their nappy. So think about giving the children that little bit of movement around with no nappy on and so on. That beautiful dry feeling that the baby has. Some centres will have a requirement that you send the nappies in. Some will have nappies available that you will change them during the day. It depends on the centre. Some will encourage parents to have reusable nappies. So when we talk about sustainability in the tutorial, that can be one of the things you can consider is that idea of sustainability in some way. So then we move from nappies into toileting. Now potty training is is hard. <laughs> it's hard and it's likely it'll occur sometime in the toddler years, most of the time around the three-year-old age bracket. You will have some very young children, you might even have 18 months old, who are able to independently tell you in some way, maybe not in words, but in actions that they need to go to the toilet. They will still need some help to get changed and so on. And then most of the time, by the time they're three, hopefully the caregivers have put them into appropriate clothing that they can easily take down and sit on the toilet in some way. Now toilet training and learning it's based on lots of individual readiness as well as different cultures and practices. So some families will want their children trained really early to be able to independently use the toilet. Other people are quite comfortable with their being a little bit later. My suggestion is you want children to be able to start kindy confidently being able to use the toilet by themselves. Now, sometimes you'll find that girls learn control earlier than the boys. Apparently it's to do with our anatomy that we have fewer muscles that are involved in our bladder and uh, bowel control. And sometimes boys have difficulty understanding when to go and so on. So just give them lots and lots of opportunities. We follow the parents lead when determining the toilet training. And also it requires lots of communication with the primary caregivers about the type of clothing that will work really well in the childcare setting because you need to have the child be able to remove their clothing easily but also that you want to be able to wash it easily and so on and you need to have lots and lots of spare jocks and knickers and things like that and have that as part of your processes as well. So signs that a child is ready, they're learning to pull down their own pants, they're trying to sit on the toilet or the potty, they're staying drier longer. They might even be telling you, like I said, either in words or actions, that they need changing. So they've recognised they've done it and that they would like to be changed. They have to know they've done it before they can know what happens before that. So accidents, you will have lots and lots of those. Just be very gentle and caring about it. It's an essential part of what is going to happen as part of learning how to use a toilet. So when we think about what care routines are and how they fit, remember we went through very briefly those four main care routines. Think about where does it fit in the EYLF? What does it say about our routines? So we're going to explore that in a little bit more depth in our tutorials and you'll see that the quality standards also has some things where we talk about it. So in our quality area two that we explored last week, children's health and safety, their idea of sleep and rest, health hygiene, safe food practices, they all fit within our routines. Quality area five, which talks about relationships with children's with children. They're about our interactions with those children. It fits with our routines and how we want to develop those. And quality area six is developing good relationships, collaborative ones with parents and communities. So we are making sure that we are respecting parents' ideas about child rearing, about sleep, about toileting and so on. So your assignment that you have coming up it asks you to look at the qualities of best practice for children in three different um, age brackets and in two different routines. So we'll explore that and go through that in a little bit more detail 
as it gets closer to the assignment time. Now, our sustainability, we're going to look at that in our tutorial. So our EYLF has eight principles, the new one. One of those principles is focused on sustainability and it's written as consider sustainability in all its forms. And what we're going to look at is what does this mean for the way that a child care center runs? So that's part of what we are going to look at in our tutorials. So apologies for the dog in the background. I think the HelloFresh is getting delivered. So our lecture review, all children have essential needs. Those care routines ensure that we are meeting those needs. Our four types of routines that we look at are our transitions, including arrivals and departures, sleep, feeding, and our toileting. Routines help to build attachment between the children and the caregivers. And sustainability is now included in our EYLF. We have to think about how we are going to build it into what we do in an early years center. Now our tutorial, we've got our first practice quiz. We're gonna focus on the routines of transitions, particularly arrivals and departures, and we're gonna explore the idea of sustainability in childcare and what it really means. In week four, you're going to have a new tutor for tutorials. I will talk to you more about that. I will record the lecture for you and your routines are toileting and sleep in week four. So this week, transitions, following week, toileting and sleep. Thanks everyone, and I will see you all in our tutorials. Bye.